Today I'll be painting the Zeta unit from the O12 faction in Corvus Bellis Infinity. Hey guys, I'm Zoltan and you're watching Phalanx Miniatures. As usual I have my model primed black, but because I'm going for a really nice and vibrant blue, hopefully, I cannot just spray the blue over this. If I did, the blue would get much more desaturated and darker than I would like it to be. So instead I'm going to go for a zenithal highlight. The upside of this is that it will provide me with a nice bright undercoat, however it will also destroy our shadows. At least the shadows that are between the different armor panels, so if something faces up it doesn't matter if it's deep, this is gonna get some white in there, so that means that in the end we will have to do some black lining to make up for it. But in the end doing black lining is still easier than trying to build up the blue to the same saturation in my experience at least, so well, zenithal highlight it is. If you have seen any of my videos, or many of my videos, then you can probably guess what kind of color I'm using here for my darkest blue. It's almost always dark Prussian blue because I just love this color. But at the same time, I also would like to call your attention to the fact that I kind of mess up with the colors here a little bit and I really wanted to leave this in the video to see that YouTubers don't always get it right for the first time either. Since this was the first time I painted something from O12, especially on this scale, I was not sure exactly which color is going to be the right one for me, so I just went with something familiar first, which was the dark Prussian blue, and I was intending to kind of correct along the way. Once I achieved full coverage with the dark Prussian blue, I had to go for the highlights, and as you can already see on the model, there is some highlights already just based on the zenithal, because that creates this kind of like gradient on the panels. But that was not enough, I wanted to go higher, so I chose flat blue for this. But as I was doing this, I already realized that there is going to be a problem here, which is that this model looks way too bright for my intended purpose. I still had to apply a lot of edge highlights here, and there had to be a nice contrast between the shadows and the highlights, and if I am already this high in brightness on the panels themselves, then we are going to have a problem later on. So because I was not really satisfied with either the brightness or the shade of the model for what I intended, I decided to turn to ultramarine contrast. The nice thing about contrast when you use it like this is that it acts like an ink, which in this case means that it will allow me to retain some of the shading and highlighting that I had before, even though it might look like I'm destroying it, but it will also darken the model at the same time, which is exactly what I needed here. So now seeing this, you might be asking yourself, what if you just spray this ultramarine contrast over the zenithal highlight? And you know what? Maybe it would work, but it would be different in the end. And I think I would like it less. So I would not change it. I would still go this route, I think. But try it out. If you think that's easier and it costs less time, of course, then why not? All right, so now that I was mostly satisfied with my base coat for the blue, it was time to fill in all the other colors. And fortunately for us, this model really only has three main elements or main colors on it. All the gold elements that are nicely contrasting with the blue armor, and I'm going to be using the Strynox Heights to undercoat all of those, and all the other metal elements that I'm going to be undercoating with the black. There is not much to this step, to be honest. All you need to do is to identify all the elements, and ideally really all of them, because you don't want to just go back and paint in other things later on, and then just make sure that you nicely and fully undercoat them with either the Rhinox hides or the black. This is also the time to realize how many of those elements there are, because when you start a paint job, at least that's how it works for me, I always think, oh, it's gonna be easy, that doesn't really have too many things on it, it's gonna take me no time at all. And then I reach this step, and I'm painting in all the bits and bobs, and then realize that, oh god, there is a lot of them and there is more. <laughs> And for whatever reason, I was especially guilty of this with this model as it was sitting on my shelf and I was looking at the key arts, I was thinking that this is going to be the easiest tag to paint. So that turned out to be a mistake, that's for sure, this is absolutely not an easy tag to paint. I'm not sure which one is the easiest, but this is not it. But once I finally had all the little details painted in, it was time to start the highlighting process. And this actually is the reason why I thought that this is going to be easy. Because if you look at the box art, and I wanted to kind of go for the same style as usual, this model is not highlighted the way most others are. Most of the tags, and actually most of the models in Infinity, are painted with large volumetric highlights. So what does that mean? That means that usually when you first do the edge highlights, you are left with a lot of space in between, especially on the larger armor panels, let's say on the legs. And what you would do is to fill in that space with additional highlights of your own, or at least a nice transition. But this model is different, because on this model there is only edge highlights and little scratches, and then a couple of very well placed highlights with an airbrush. So I thought I would imitate this style and learn it myself, because I usually don't do this and 
That would save me a lot of time, right? Because I don't have to do those volumetric highlights. And turns out that's actually true. It was much faster, but uh, unfortunately I underestimated how many other different elements there are on this model, especially the gold, and that still has to be done with the volumetric style. But the overall plan was very, very simple. First, I used the first highlight to outline every single edge, and I tried to make it so that this highlight is quite thick because I still want to fit another highlight inside of it. Other than edge highlights, the only thing I do is to already with this color apply some basic scratching on the armor because the panels are relatively flat and there's not going to be major highlights on it as we said, so there needs to be a little bit of visual variety there, something to catch your eye. And once I outlined all the edges, I went on immediately to deep sky blue. And you might be thinking, oh god, that's a really big jump and that's going to be extremely jarring. And you would be right, but that's also intentional because later on we will do a step that is going to knock this back a little bit. That's one thing. And the other thing that this is kind of part of this style. Uh, you have to make the edge highlights really striking because there is not going to be much else on this model. Just notice that I don't use this on every single edge. I'm using it on, let's say, 70% of the edges that I already outlined with the previous color. I'm concentrating this color mostly on the upper facing edges and the ones that are, let's say, out in the light. So anything that faces down or something that is under something else, let's say the arm, then I would not use this color because it wouldn't catch the light as much. And even if I do, because occasionally you might want to show a little bit of a glint even in the shadows, you shouldn't cover the whole edge. And of course don't forget about those tiny scratches because otherwise the panels are going to look a little bit too basic. Once I covered all the edges, it was time to use deep sky blue again, but this time through the airbrush. And you want to use this extremely diluted. It was like maybe 20% or maybe even just 10% of paint into the thinner, because otherwise it would be just too much and you would just paint all over what you already established. And the point here is to create some of these really small reflections or small highlights, especially on the largest panels that you have, like for example on the upper leg. You have to be quite subtle with this, but to be fair, I think in the end I didn't do enough here. Because in the next step, I wanted to use Talisar Blue to tint the armor once again a little bit, because I was still not completely satisfied with the overall tone. And because I wanted to use this to knock back some of the very harsh highlights that I established before. And that worked actually quite well, especially on the edge highlights that I created, but they were much harsher than the airbrush highlights that we just did and therefore that was a little bit overshadowed by the Talisar Blue. So if you do this, I would advise you to apply a little bit more highlight, I would say, but the same amount of Talisar Blue so that the highlight in the end shines through a little bit more. And of course the Talisar Blue was heavily diluted once again. If I did this out of the pot, it would have covered way too much. And with that, I was basically done with the blue armor, at least for now, because once I paint in all the other elements, especially the big ones like the gold, that will completely change how the blue looks. And I made some adjustments later on, but very tiny ones only. And with that, let's move on to the gold. And the gold is done in a more traditional way with standard volumetric highlights, which actually, I think, contrasts really nicely with the different style of the armor. We already had the Rhinox hide as our base color, and then I used the Japanese brown to create all the edge highlights as well as the volumetric highlights inside the edge highlights. And to speed things up, because as I said, there's a lot of elements, I used base color consistency here. So this is thick paint, I don't care about dilution, this is not glazing, this is just painting on this, and then later on we are going to be smoothing it out. And not only is this base color consistency, but I also don't care about how thick my lines are, I just care about outlining everything, and I just want to have basically a sketch of where all my highlights are going to be. And once I have this sketch established, then I add a little bit of whole red to my Japanese brown. So instead of going up, now we are going to establish some shadows. This will actually do multiple things. One, it will make our shadows more interesting with a little bit of red in them, but it also will smooth out the gradient between the Rhinox hide and the Japanese brown. Just make sure that you brace the airbrush so that you hit the exact spot that you want to hit. You can see me actually doing this on my thumb which is a good way to support the airbrush, in my experience at least. And then try to aim exactly between the Rhinox hide and the Japanese brown, kind of where the two colors meet, and smooth out the transition that you already had there, the edge between the two colors, with extremely diluted paint and spraying a lot of coats. As the next step, I'm using Japanese brown again, but this time through the airbrush. And remember that everything that you spray through the airbrush is going to be slightly more bright 
than if you apply the same color through the brush. So even though you already have Japanese brown on the model, you first of all tainted it a little bit probably with the whole red, but also because this is a tiny bit brighter through the airbrush, this is essentially a highlight now. And this is exactly where I'm applying it as well. So instead of shooting it just like we did before with the whole red and Japanese brown combo into the shadows, this time I'm actually shooting it into the Japanese brown and away from the shadows. And if we did our job right, then in the end we come out with something that is way smoother than what we had before, but it also has some nice contrast between the shadows and the highlight. The problem that we have right now is that I use the airbrush quite a bit, first with the zenithal and then multiple colors, so I shot a lot into the crevices between the armor panels. There is not a lot of black lining left, so now I have to re-establish that so that there is nice separation between the panels. All it takes is a nice pointy brush, a little bit of brush control and watered down black paint. And then methodically going through the whole model and establishing a black line between every single panel wherever it's possible. Once you are done with this, you will notice that this creates a crazy amount of definition on the model together with the edge highlights. But now it's time to work more on those gold non-metallics because there's quite a bit of highlighting left to do. So with the Sahara Yellow, I'm working only within the highlights that I already established, except maybe a couple of scratches here and there. You're probably already tired of me saying this, but don't forget to reduce your highlights as you go up in brightness. And that means that you reduce the size of the volumetric highlights but also that you don't hit every single edge, because if you do, then you destroy everything that you did before. You should always go for the upper facing edges, but not all of them, less and less of them as you go up in the highlights. And as you switch to Sahara Yellow, which you use for the same exact purpose, but for even less surface and even less of the edges, you also should try to make your edge highlights thinner and thinner. The nice thing about going up in the highlights is that you have to paint less and less surface, so it takes you less and less time, but at the same time you also have to be more and more careful and precise with your brush strokes. But along the way also don't forget about those little scratches because they really add a lot to the model in the end. Alright, so before I move on to the final highlights, it's time to do one more airbrushing step. I take the sand yellow again and dilute it like crazy and don't forget, through the airbrush this color is actually going to be even lighter than through the brush. So this is going to be a highlight. Only put it into the already established sand yellow as much as you can. But because you are using this through the airbrush and because you are most likely not going to be 100% precise, the little halo that it will create around where you are spraying is going to be able to help you smooth out the transitions between this and the previous color. I know that it sounds pretty crazy to use an almost white paint through the airbrush on a model that is already mostly painted, but if you have the paint diluted enough, so remember 10-20% if you're adventurous to 80% thinner, and you go slowly and apply a lot of thin layers, you should be fine and it will look pretty cool in the end. But with that we are almost done, there is only the ice yellow to go because I wanted the steel non-metallic to be brighter, so here I'm just going to go up until ice yellow. Just remember to be very sparing with this, don't apply it on all the edges even if they face up. Just go for the corners and some of the most visible edges. And this is the time to make it as thin and precise as possible. And of course don't forget about the tiny scratches, those are very important. Before you call it done, what you can also do is you can bring back a little bit of the color if it was bleached out a bit too much by the airbrush. I used a little bit of Ian and yellow contrast paint heavily diluted for this as a glaze and applied it mostly into the mid-tones and between the mid-tones and the shadows trying not to hit the highlights too much. And as usual you can apply multiple thin layers with this until you are satisfied and the saturation is back to the level that you want it to be. Before I show you the final model with all the rest of the elements painted in, I will show you how I made the base because I think it's quite cool. The actual basing was done with a terrain product from AK Interactive called Asphalt, which produced this really asphalt looking texture on the base. And then the whole thing is already black just by itself, so I didn't have to do anything. Now we just have to paint it a little bit. I overbrushed the base with two gray colors, first a darker one and then a slightly lighter one. This is similar to dry brushing, but I didn't actually dry the brush. I just kind of took the paint, wicked it off a little bit, and then kind of did the same thing as you would do with a normal dry brushing. I wanted to retain some of the black in the, the shadows and have some variety in the grays. Once I was satisfied with the gray, I used some masking tape to block some of the base so I can create some cool designs on it. I wanted to create the feeling that this is some kind of runway or maybe a highway or something like that. So I wanted to have some not continuous stripes, so I wanted to at least have one break in them, but then also something like a part of a number or something similar. When everything was marked out, all I needed is some white paint and then shoot it through the airbrush. And there you go, now it looks like he's standing on a highway. And with everything painted in, the model looks something like this.
If you guys have any questions or comments or just want to let me know whether you like the paint job or not, please do so in the comments. I'm super happy to answer. And you can also tell me if you want me to paint any specific model in Infinity or something else. In the meantime, please consider giving the video a like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out. And see you in the next one.